Great. So we will be recording this presentation for everyone and plan to send it out um, after the webinar is completed, along with the slide decks that our presenters are utilizing. Um, our presentation will also be uploaded to the Foundation for Healthcare Quality's YouTube channel and can be viewed there. At the end of our presentation today, we plan to have a Q&A with our speakers. If you would like to ask a question, please submit your question in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We just wanted to highlight at the foundation that we have a total of six programs and the Brie Collaborative is one of the programs um, housed at the foundation. It was created in 2011 by the legislature to bring together members from the different areas of the healthcare sector to address key health topics that impact Washingtonians by being a place for convening and collaboration. We work closely together to develop these reports that can then be utilized by the health ecosystem, health ecosystem for improvement. To date, we have over 40 reports, and this current year, we're looking at developing reports on diabetes care, perinatal and maternal mental health, and difficult to discharge clients. Today for our presentation, we are going to hear from one of our staff members, Nick Locke, who helps support the work group in developing their free report, Dr. Kiss, and Annie Hetzel. I'll pass it off to Nick Locke. Thank you, Emily, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nick Locke, and I use he, him pronouns, and I'm currently the Director of Research and Best Practice of the Foundation. Um, most of my job is facilitating our work groups, like this one on pediatric asthma. And while I like to say that I'm not the subject matter expert here, I just uh, help facilitate conversation and prepare meeting materials. Today, I'm going to try to give an overview of why the Brie chose pediatric asthma as a topic for 2022 and give some of our recommendations for different healthcare uh, sectors. Uh, again, I'm not the expert here, so even as I go over some of the recommendations, I may not be able to answer direct questions, but if you do have questions about the sections that I cover, I would be happy to point you to some of our work group members who do more work in those areas for follow-up. So yes, first for the background on pediatric asthma and why we chose this as a topic in 2022. Every year, the Brie tries to choose areas where there are high utilization and high variation and not necessarily better outcomes. And so we were looking at pediatric asthma and we saw that there are over half a million people in Washington state living with asthma and between eight to 11% of children in middle and high school have asthma. And many times this makes asthma a leading cause of unexcused absences in schools or excused absences. We know that one in five youth with asthma visited an emergency room to manage their symptoms. And asthma definitely can have long-term poor outcomes for students if it's leading to chronic absenteeism, uh, academic, uh, affecting academic success, and leading to higher rates of depression and suicidal thoughts. I think additionally, it's important to call out that in the United States, the burden of asthma falls disproportionately on Black, Hispanic, and American Indian Alaskan Native populations. And we know that there are inequities present in asthma prevalence, mortality, and access to healthcare services. And so I think that was a really important piece as we went through our conversation. How can we uh, improve asthma outcomes, but also equi equitably advanced asthma care. Next slide, please. So when we first began convening the work group, we wanted to recognize that a lot of asthma care happens outside of clinical spaces. Uh, we know that children are uh, in schools, they have their own home settings, they might have their own environmental exposures based on which neighborhoods they're living in. And so one of our big goals was to try to look at every uh, area, every setting that might affect asthma control, and try to find different ways that we can make recommendations to those settings and encourage alignment across sectors. And so this uh, chart here shows some of our focus areas, those specific settings that we try to address. And that includes clinical settings, home settings, school settings, uh, and then environmental exposures, whether that's climate or neighborhood exposures. And you'll see at the bottom there too, we also highlighted funding. And I know that funding is not its own setting, 
but we just recognized that a lot of this uh, alignment and coordination work requires dollars that need to be funneled um, not just to healthcare, but also around the system overall. So we wanted to look at funding mechanisms that could help pay for some of this work, uh, both in the community and in schools. Next slide. And as we developed these recommendations, we also targeted them to specific audiences. And so if you are able to uh, read the report or access the report, you can see that each recommendation is given based on the healthcare stakeholder or audience that you're a part of. So if you um, wanted to just scroll to the relevant information to you, we hope that the recommendations would be uh, very straightforward and easy to use. Specifically for this report, we separated recommendations based on delivery systems, clinicians, uh, home-based interventions and community health workers, schools, payers and purchasers, public health agencies, and patients and community members. And then again, if you are able to access the report, we hope that it supplements existing treatment guidelines. We didn't try to rewrite the guidelines from NIH or the GINA Global Asthma Initiative. Uh, we really wanted to use what was already out there and then try to advance asthma care by creating opportunities for alignment and coordination. So uh, additionally, the report also provides context for what needs to be done to improve care so that if there are any specific recommendations that you want to look up more information, uh, that's available in the evidence review section of the report. So now I'll go on to uh, giving a brief overview of three of our specific sectors that we targeted uh, recommendations towards, which include home-based multi-component interventions, which I'll talk about first, as well as some of our recommendations for payers and purchasers and public health agencies. I think our home-based multi-component interventions was one of the areas that we were uh, very excited about as we were working on this project. Uh, and here we know that the Community Preventative Services Task Force does strongly recommend home-based multi-trigger multi-component interventions as an evidence-based approach to improving asthma outcomes. And so in our work group, we tried to really highlight what are some of the key components of these interventions in order to make them effective. And then also we talked a little bit about what funding strategies can make sure that these interventions are able to reach the people who need them the most. So as a just a brief overview, these multi-component interventions are really interventions that provide self-management education to uh, patients and their caregivers, specifically about environmental triggers, especially those related to the home. And as we were talking through these programs in our work group, we also wanted to make sure that these programs would be able to provide uh, the environmental management services that might be able to improve indoor or outdoor air quality. So things like uh, making sure that houses are using non-toxic cleaners, that they have portable air filtration devices or air filters, especially in times of high wildfire smoke. Um, and then also making sure that they were able to provide either access or referrals to home modification services, things like mold removal uh, when needed to bring asthma under control. So it was really both of those uh, pieces of self-management education, making sure that parents are trying to provide smoke-free environments, but also uh, a management and abatement supplies to actually make changes that might be necessary when a family might not be able to afford those changes on their own. Next slide. And I think one of the reasons that we were really excited about uh, home-based multi-component interventions as uh, an example of an effective asthma management strategy was that there is a successful example of these programs within Washington State. The Healthy Homes Program out of Public Health of Seattle and King County has been working on uh, training community health workers to provide these services in the King County community for several years now. And when they started this project, they really started small so that they would be able to evaluate their outcomes and see improvement. They aimed to reduce asthma triggers and weatherize the homes of approximately 60 low-income households. They, uh, one of the innovative strategies was partnering with schools and Head Start centers to be able to reach community members. And at the end of uh, the first few years of this um, program, they were able to show that combining the healthy home intervention with actual physical changes to uh, the home environment 
did significantly improve childhood asthma control. And so I highly encourage you to look up some of the examples of success of this program. I think it was a great example for our work group to hear from members who had been a part of the program and think about ways that we might be able to either scale up or provide similar services in different environments. Uh, one thing that I will say, though, about the drawbacks of these programs are that it is currently pretty difficult to find sustainable funding to make sure we're able to get these programs to people who need them. And that sort of leads me into my next slide. So I know I mentioned how we were trying to discuss funding mechanisms, especially funding for programs that happen outside of the clinic. And so we did target some of our recommendations specifically to payers and purchasers. And uh, you can see in the bullets here that some of our recommendations were pretty directly just about services that should be covered. So that includes uh, spacers, inhalers, including dry powder inhalers, routine asthma control visits, and annual flu shots for children with asthma. But we also really wanted to encourage payers and purchasers to explore alternative coverage options, um, especially on the spectrum from fee-for-service to population-based payments. Uh, specifically, too, we were interested in coverage for care coordination and in lieu of services for patients with uncontrolled asthma. And here, too, we drew a lot from the healthcare authorities' ongoing work related to their Medicaid transformation project and primary care transformation model. There are some upcoming changes for Medicaid in Washington State to be able to cover care coordination and in lieu of services. And we were interested in seeing how other organizations could either use that existing work or adopt some of those existing models in their own settings. So I highly encourage you to look at the report for some of um, those specific examples and be thinking about how we can uh, perhaps be transforming how we pay for value in our healthcare system. And next slide. So the final slide and group that I wanted to cover was public health agencies. And I want to recognize that public health agencies are varied. For example, we know the healthcare authority um, has done a lot of work related to financing and providing Medicaid services versus the Department of Health does a lot of work with regulation and population health management. But we did want to highlight the role of public health as supporting and coordinating existing programs and advancing population health. So some of the strategies that we included here are um, again, supporting community health workers, whether that's directly providing those programs like Public Health of Seattle and King County, or providing reimbursement mechanisms for community organizations to provide those programs. And then we also wanted to encourage public health programs to um, develop and update guidance for indoor and outdoor air quality, as well as preparedness and mitigation plans for extreme weather events. We know the Department of Health has done some of this work, especially related to air qualities in schools, but uh, I think it's important here to, to be mindful that as we're looking at uh, climate and its climate change and its impacts on health, we need to be prepared for um, changing climates to take a toll on health conditions like pediatric asthma and be thinking about how we can be prepared for the future and make sure that we are uh, adapting to those changes. And another great example here that I would just point out is that uh, current public health programs are able to partner with the Department of Commerce, uh, the Washington Department of Commerce, to provide products to improve indoor air quality for asthma patients as well. So I think some of those innovative partnerships are another way that we can be providing services to asthma patients across the state. And so my final slide is, again, sort of a high-level slide, and I just wanted to reiterate that one of our biggest goals with this pediatric asthma report was to find ways that we can increase alignment and communication across all of these settings. And I'm sure, I'm sure Doreen and Annie are going to talk more about the importance of communication between clinics and schools, so I'll be looking forward to hearing more about that. But it's important to recognize that we all play a role in um, addressing both upstream drivers of asthma as well as addressing asthma uh, in clinical spaces, in school spaces, and through community health programs. So I'll leave it there, and I believe I'll be turning it over to Doreen to talk about clinical spaces. 
Thank you, Nick. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Doreen Kish, I'm a pediatrician with UW Medicine Primary Care. My clinic is located in South King County, uh, Kent Des Moines area, and we serve a pretty broad range of pediatric patients down on the south end. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how clinician uh, and clinical sites can use these recommendations. Um, so just a brief background, what affects asthma care and outcomes in kids? I can't tell you how often I come in in the morning and the family's like, I needed an inhaler at two in the morning um, because I ran out. So getting people prepared before the emergency happened is a big part of uh, planning for better outcomes for kids with asthma. And like Nick mentioned, the majority of asthma care does not happen in a doctor's office. It happens at schools, it happens on the playground. Families are having to make all of these decisions that impact the child's well-being when it comes to asthma. And the more knowledge they have about asthma, the more they understand the disease, push for the medication compliance, have the medications at home, plan, all of these make a big difference on asthma outcomes. Um, in school settings, the teachers notice it in PE, they notice it with school absenteeism. Um, and the unfortunate truth is asthma is often treated as a series of emergencies. It shows up in the ER, it shows up in urgent care, and families just go from one crisis to another without thinking to spend the time on preventive care um, because asthma is very treatable. Triggers, uh, as Nick mentioned, in the home, in the environment. Uh, we just had a huge community viral surge this fall with flu, RSV, all of these things impact our asthmatic kids. And then of course, uh, home settings, dust, mite, pollens, molds, et cetera. Next slide, please. Asthma really affects the quality of life of our children. Um, so the, how asthma works is it causes chronic inflammation or swelling and mucus production in the lungs of children. And different things trigger this inflammation. But as a result, kids with asthma, they cough. They have a day cough. If they have a cold, they can cough for months. Um, they, they, it affects their exercise tolerance and an end result is they tend to avoid sports and avoid exercise if not treated. Um, and then parents can actually inappropriately reduce their activity. Oh, I tell him not to run. We don't play outside because he has asthma. And that affects play and especially outdoor play, which is so critical for the mental and physical health of our children. Um, their sleep is disrupted from coughing at night. They miss school. They miss out on education because of asthma that's not controlled. And then asthma can be traumatizing. If you end up in the ER, if you get an IV, x-rays, um, oral steroids is not fun to be on. You won't sleep for nights. Um, and asthma can be life-threatening and kids can end up in the ICU and on ventilators. Um, so it can be very traumatizing. And then if you've ever been short of breath, it is very anxiety provoking. And for a child to continuously have difficulties breathing um, very much affects their quality of life. Next slide, please. So it doesn't have to be this way. We can do better. Asthma is really treatable. We have great medications. It's just convincing people to take them and not run out. Um, really the symptoms can be very well controlled exacerbations, ER visits, hospitalizations really can be avoided. A child with asthma should never avoid sports, should not be missing school all the time. Uh, I will point out to my families, all these Olympic athletes who have asthma, it can be controlled and you should be in sports. Um, with home education and home visits, especially the community health worker program, triggers can be mitigated. And then on clinician side, uh, we should be filling asthma medication, updating them. Families should not run out of inhalers. Next slide. So the goal of life for asthma, normal life, free of symptoms. And I think you have to set that goal with families, not to just say, well, he coughs because he has asthma. No, he shouldn't cough. We can do better. Next slide. 
So the brief collaborative recommendations in the clinical setting. Number one, to appropriately establish asthma diagnosis, including severity and risk. This is very well outlined in the National Health, uh, Heart and Lung and Blood Institute. There are very specific guidelines for categorizing asthma and leading to the proper diagnosis and the proper medications. And number two, develop an asthma action plan to effectively control asthma. I'm gonna talk about this later in the presentation. Um, and number three, implement appropriate asthma metrics to ensure quality. If you don't measure, you don't know how well you're doing. Next slide, please. So how do we get there? Um, I'm gonna talk about a number of these topics on future slides, um, but briefly recognize it, make the right diagnosis prevent it, and we're going to talk about the annual well asthma visit. Um, population health, have a registry, do outreach, and crisis management, move asthma from the emergency department over to primary care. Very important to categorize the severity. It's not just asthma, it's moderate persistent asthma, because that guides you choosing the appropriate medications for that severity. And then educate the family. Everything uh, on this child's outcomes will determine how what will be uh, as a result of how well the family understands their disease and makes the right decisions. Um, follow up with the family again and again and again until home management is understood. I have in my practice a family who immigrated from Iraq. I think we met with them 10 times before they understood which inhaler did what uh, with interpreter and with my nurse. But after 10 times, they got it and they haven't had issues since. And then measure, follow up on your hospitalizations and your ER visits and follow your quality metrics. Next slide, please. So asthma diagnosis and recognizing. Um, I see a lot of kids who end up in the adult emergency departments and taken care of by adult providers. And asthma is not recognized in those settings. Uh, they, they come back to you, they had bronchitis, they had pneumonia again and again and again. And when you look at it, they had a cold and they were wheezing. Um, there is no pediatric bronchitis in a non-smoking five-year-old. It doesn't exist. Um, it's an adult diagnosis, and usually it's a viral illness. So in the old days, we saw a lot of kids treated with antibiotics every time they came in with a bad cough and asthma was being missed. Um, for providers, think about asthma in any child who coughs for a long time after a cold. Um, think about asthma in any child who has wheezing again and again with colds. And then there's a triad, we call it atopic. It's eczema, allergies, and asthma. And genetically, they run in families. So if you have eczema and allergies, we're kind of watching for asthma because it wouldn't be surprised if you had that also. Um, and then an objective measurement, any child five and older can do spirometry. And that's something we should be doing in our primary care offices. Next slide, please. So if you remember anything from my presentation, I want you to remember this one, the asthma annual well visit. I think any chronic disease shouldn't just be managed you know, on top of a checkup, yep, let's refill your meds, or in the ER without follow-up. This is a disease that is so easy to control, but it takes time and it takes focus. And asthma should have a visit all to itself every single year. Um, as kids get older, often the severity of their asthma changes. Their medications should change with that. Um, sometimes they move to foster care. Sometimes dad now has custody. You have a new parent that you need to teach all about asthma. So this as an annual visit is very, very worthwhile. So what do we do at the annual visit? I schedule it in the fall. So all summer long, as I'm doing all my sports physicals and kids are coming in for checkups, if they have persistent asthma on their problem list, my MA and I schedule them for their well asthma visit every October. And now what do you do at this visit? Well, first of all, review their symptom control and assess for severity. And there's some tools for this. Spirometry is a great tool looking at their lung function. And there's a really nice, um, 
It's called the asthma control test, and it's a review of symptoms, and it looks at symptom control, day cough, night cough, symptoms with exercise. Um, you can Google it and download it. It's free. We use that at every asthma visit, and it tells you, are they in control? Are they not in control? And then prescribe the appropriate meds for their level of severity. Give them refills to last all winter. If you want them on two puffs twice a day, don't make them run out in three months and have to call. Um, so give them enough to last uh, for both controller and rescue inhalers. Spacers are really important. So when kids spray it up to their mouth without a spacer, a lot of the medicine sticks in the oral mucosa, sticks in the mouth and doesn't get to the lungs. So when you use a spacer, it's not just an age and a timing thing, it's an everybody thing. You get much more medicine effectively to your lungs. Um, and so you need multiple spacers. You need one at school, you need one at grandparents for daycare, you need one at home, or maybe the two parents live in two different households. As my action plan, I'm gonna talk about in a minute. This is a sick day plan. So there's a lot you can do when you start to have symptoms. You don't just have to kind of wait and see if you end up having a bad attack. There's a lot you can do to prevent an attack. And then educate, educate, educate. And it's not just the one parent who came in on day one, but try to get the second parent, try to get the grandparents. There's a lot of education that needs to have happen. And then influenza or flu, that is a huge trigger of asthma. All colds can trigger asthma, but flu is the big bad wolf. Um, and so flu shot is really mandatory for all of our asthma kids. And with this fall visit, you can sort of prepare for the cold and flu season, get your flu shot, get your meds updated. Everybody knows what to do. It is a very worthwhile visit. Next slide, please. So here's an example of an asthma action plan. Um, we set it up like a stop and go light. So green, yellow, red. Green means good, you're good. So this is what you do every single day to prevent your asthma. And I put down a rescue medicine as needed and then the daily medicine, two puffs twice a day. Now, let's say you're starting to get sick. You're starting to cough. You're now in the yellow zone. What can you do? You can actually increase your controller medicine to try to push down the asthma, decrease the inflammation. Um, some families even have an emergency dose of an oral steroid that they can start in the evening and call us in the clinic the next day. And they didn't have to go to the ER because they basically got the same treatment at home. So having a plan that you can do at home really decreases having to go to urgent care, having to go to the ER. It gives families a plan. What can I do when my kid gets sick? It really works. And families often don't even have to call us. They can just carry out this plan at home. When the child's better, they go back to the everyday um, medication plan. And that's pretty much it. Next slide, please. Optimizing the home environment. Um, Nick talked a bit about the community health worker for asthma, and we actually were part of that program. We sent quite a lot of kids, referred them in for this uh, grant funded program, and it was just outstanding. Um, parental education, there's never enough time for this. Plus you can often meet multiple family members when you go to their home. Next slide, please. Asthma quality metrics. So our ICD-10 codes that we use for billing and coding, um, the level 10 is a lot better than the old ICD-9. They actually, it's not just asthma, but now it's moderate persistent asthma in control or out of control. So just how we code for asthma, um, you actually get a lot better handle on how your asthmatics are doing and how many you have. Um, there's a measure called the asthma medication ratio, which looks at how often uh, families fill the rescue medicine compared to their daily medicine. And then, of course, you can follow annual flu shot completion. Next slide, please. So um, my other hat that I do for UW Medicine is I lead pediatrics population health for UW primary care. Um, with chronic diseases, you have to reach out. You have to bring families in for needed care. So how do you do this? Well, start uh, with an asthma registry, especially if you have this within your IT and your EMR. Know who your patients are. Um, we follow specifically the persistent asthmatics, um, not just the intermittent once in a while, but we really focus on the persistent asthmatics. 
um, make sure you're being notified every time your patient shows up in the ER or gets hospitalized, because that is a kid, we look at every ER visit as a failure of primary care. That kid needs to come in. What were we missing? Were we out of meds? Were we not on the right meds? Did parents not know what to do? Let's bring them in and let's start over and see if we can prevent the next one. You need a nurse care manager for tracking these patients, spending time educating, demonstrating how to use a spacer, how to use your devices. Um, an annual outreach for that fall asthma prevention visit, highly, highly encouraged. Um, get that flu shot in the fall. There are many ways to do it. You can do it through a patient portal. There's text outreach, um, many ways to do it. And then I think the bottom line is all of this very valuable pop health outreach preventive work, it's done by staff and staff do not bill for this work um, in our fee for service system. So looking at the ways uh, that we fund healthcare, if we can include the team, because we need the team to do this work. And at the moment, the team is just an expense um, and many clinics do not have this team. So putting in a plug for um, healthcare transformation and how we're paid. I think that's my last one. I'll turn it over to Annie. Thank you, Dr. Kish. That was excellent. I actually took notes and I've seen this presentation <laughs> before, so I appreciate that. Um, next slide, please. So these are the highlights of the recommendations for schools and school nurses. Um, uh, number one, uh, work to identify students with asthma. I think that's something that naturally happens at schools. Um, Dr. Kishmet mentioned the PE teacher notices or the absenteeism, but also school nurses see these students in the health room or other staff have concerns and bring them to the school nurse. And very often we're the first ones to find out that a student has asthma or to suspect a student has asthma and refer. Um, and I really appreciated um, Dr. Kish's uh, information about the bronchitis because we also, we often see parents, as I'm gonna mention a little bit more later on, but we see parents arrive in the school health room with an inhaler. They've been to the emergency room the night before and they're not really sure what the diagnosis is. And we end up, because our systems require us to put a label of some sort. So we guess and put asthma down just based on the, the presence of an inhaler. So accurate uh, diagnosis and communication with that about that to the school is, really helpful for us. And uh, we develop a, a care plan for all students with asthma and update the care plan at least annually. This is something um, we're already doing or should be doing already, um, at least when we know which students have asthma. Include education on proper inhaler technique and medication management as part of the care plan. I think that's something that school nurses do um, from day to day. We have more opportunities to observe students using inhalers and to catch them and coach them on proper technique and um, timing. So this is uh, really a key piece and this is where we can really support students with, um, with asthma. Refer to existing resources for managing asthma in the school environment. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a little while and ensure healthy school environments for asthma management and control. And this is where school nurses can advocate with their administration and other departments for, for managing asthma and air quality in the school setting. Next slide, please. So I wanna um, introduce you to Caitlin. Uh, Caitlin is a fictional character that I built based on several students I've known over the years with asthma. Um, she's a fourth grader, has an asthma plan on file, an inhaler in the health room, but she only has one spacer and her mother's keeping it at home. She comes to the health room with asthma symptoms and needing her rescue inhaler three plus times per week. She often looks tired and breathless um, and, is, and is tired. Caitlin tells the nurse her bedroom has mold on the walls. Her mom has tried to get uh, remediation, but the landlord is refusing to do anything. So the school nurse, you know, it, it, interventions that are implemented that can help Caitlin. Uh, staff training at the beginning of the school year um, where staff are educated about how to recognize asthma and how and what to do when they see it. 
uh, particularly when it flares. Um, the school nurse can check in with those teachers that are in charge of Caitlin with special check in with uh, playground aides and the PE teacher who, to, who can monitor activity levels and anything that happens with activity um, and review the procedures with those folks so they know about the emergency care plan and how to implement it. Um, again, the nurse continues to coach Caitlin on proper inhaler technique. Uh, but is not really sure generally what has been taught in the clinic or, or with what equipment uh, because we don't have that information. She calls, the nurse can call mom and find out that the pharmacy is not willing to give them a second spacer because the insurance company won't cover it. But mom is not sure if that's exactly what's going on. Um, so the nurse can call, uh, can provide the mom with some information about a tenant advocacy group if there is one in the area. Um, and call the, the primary care provider to try to get more information and share her concerns, but does not have a release of information on file, so communication is, is difficult. Um, and request that they talk to the mother about getting a spacer and, and, and to report the frequent health room visits. We're going to come back to Caitlin a little bit. I just In a little while, I just wanted to sort of set um, the stage for now. So can we go to the next slide, please? Some common school scenarios that we see, and I want to emphasize these are not the only scenarios that we do see in schools. Sometimes we have a number of students who have uh, care plans in place and their asthma is well controlled and we hardly ever see them in the health room. Um, but we also, the, the, these scenarios are the ones that jump out at us and that happen with um, unnerving frequency. So. We have students who come to the health room and tell the nurse they have asthma, but um, they only have one inhaler for the whole family and they all take turns using it. So it's not available for the school. It's not all that unusual to have parents tell their kids not to tell the school nurse that they have asthma because they know that there are requirements and they are spread too thin and can't, uh, or feel like they can't manage having the paperwork in place and the extra inhaler. Um, so. Uh, so, and oftentimes there is no information that was provided in the enrollment form, even if the parents know that there's asthma, sometimes they just forget to include that. They don't think of that as a health condition. Um, and, and so, you know, it happens that we have these students show up in our health rooms with an asthma crisis and needing to use an inhaler and we're scrambling trying to get a hold of parents. Um, and, and oftentimes this occurs in families that are not high income. Parents are working multiple jobs, long hours, not necessarily in the neighborhood or with a car. So it's, it can be also difficult to, um, to get some, the inhaler in any kind of uh, timely way. So, and another scenario I alluded to earlier is that parents arrive in the health room first thing in the morning, reporting they were in the ER the night before. Um, I've had parents tell me many times that they were given a diagnosis, but they can't remember what it is, but they're pretty sure it's not asthma or reactive airway disease or bronchiolitis. You know, we, we can trot out all the suggestions of things we've heard. But they just say, no, no, it was something else. And nowadays, parents are not necessarily given a paper handout like in the good old days. So they don't have anything to show the nurse or to share. A lot of things have gone um, online. Um, so, and then another way we identify students or a scenario that we see quite frequently is a student who's missing school regularly. And um, the parent excuses the absences saying their child is homesick because they're watching them for their asthma. And, and quite honestly, um, you know, we've called parents and had them say, we, don't, we just don't trust the school to know what they're doing. And we don't trust you to watch the child um, the way I'm going to watch them. Um, and, and that's a really hard scenario to address for school nurses. We, we you know, we talk about um, all of the ways we uh, implement the plan to make sure their kids are safe at school, but it's hard for those parents to trust their precious child with us, particularly when that child has a health condition that, that can escalate fairly quickly. So next slide. So um, school nurses work to identify students with asthma all of the time. This is a year round um, endeavor. 
there's a special emphasis at the beginning of the school year when we have new enrollments, new grades coming in. And so we review every student's paperwork that comes through looking for any ind indication and in the health history that the parent provide. Um, we notice symptoms in the health room. We have teachers refer to us. And then sometimes in those districts where the nurse is involved in the special education referrals, <coughs> when we do some kind of a health history with, um, with the family or we have contact with the family, we hear things that make us think that possibly this child needs to be evaluated for asthma. Next slide, please. Thank you. So developing a care plan with asthma is one of the recommendations is actually in the law. It's in statute in Washington state. So there are two specific laws that really apply here. One is RCW 28A210320, children with life-threatening health conditions, which mandates that children must have a treatment plan in place before um, school starts uh, when they have a life-threatening health condition. And this is a big point of friction uh, with um, with the clinical setting because we tend to completely overwhelm the clinical setting in August and September with requests, demands, begging for these uh, health plans. So, um, and honestly, school nurses are often really concerned about these students at the beginning of the year because, you know, with turnover of teachers and the training that's just we're trying to get that training done it's it's crunch time and it's very overwhelming for the, on the school side as well so um that's something we continue to work on and and have not come up really with good solutions of how we can handle that but these life uh, th these care plans are really really crucial for the school setting um, and it goes back I think to what Dr. Kish said about the work of the team because I've had clinics tell me it takes a full-time person processing paperwork for schools especially at the beginning of the school year and then RCW 28A210370 students with asthma that requires all school districts to have a policy um, for in-service training for school staff on symptoms, treatments, and monitoring, and also mandates the annual updating of, of the asthma treatment plan every year. And, um, and I think that's it for this slide. Uh, bear with me for a second. I want to double check my notes and make sure I did not miss anything. Yep. Next slide. Oh, you're already there. Thank you. So existing resources for managing asthma in the school environment. We have an excellent guide in Washington State called Asthma Management and Educational Settings, or the AIMS Manual, as we refer to it. Unfortunately, it was last updated in 2013 and is in dire need of, of an update. It's still pretty seminal and, and still helpful. Um, and it was created by a large work group that was funded by a grant through the Department of Health. Um, and so getting that updated will be a serious undertaking. In the meantime, I want to mention that there is a small work group from the School Nurse Corps um, that has taken on updating the resources section of this manual that's going to be added as an addendum. I believe one or two of them might actually be in the audience. So I just want to shout out to them. Um, so I really look forward to that. It will include resources on um, how to train staff and um, other, other vital resources for the schools. And then I really want to shout out our Department of Health has a couple of excellent web pages that are full of excellent resources for schools. The uh, School Environmental Health and Safety webpage with a shout out to Nancy Bernard, who's been a long champion of uh, indoor air quality, among other things, has resources on ventilation, wildfire smoke, indoor air quality. Um, we call her frequently for backup on uh, trying to get schools and school staff to stop using essential oils in the air, which is, can be a, a pretty bad asthma trigger as well. So um, we do have some great resources in Washington state, but they could be better. Next slide, please. So environment, healthy school environments for asthma management and control. This is uh, one way that uh, schools can work to really help uh, students thrive in the school setting. Um, idling policies, particularly for school buses or delivering delivery trucks. Um, 
training and posting notices around um, the hazards of having idling. I once worked in a school where the delivery trucks would back up to the loading dock and the intake for the HVAC for that building was right next to the loading dock and they would suck in all of the exhaust right into the uh, ventilation system for the school. So, you know, these are things that happen and they need to be addressed immediately. Um, indoor quality, indoor air quality, uh, we've had a lot of focus on ventilation in the last few years. So I'm really hopeful that um, the, the attention we've been uh, paying to ventilation will pay off for asthma control as well, and, but that's ongoing work. Um, continuing to advocate for not having scents and essential oils in the schools, and then healthy cleaning. Um, one thing that happened with the uh, pandemic early on is schools were buying these um, sprayers to clean, um, and they were spraying chemicals in the air on school buses and in schools, very well-intentioned, but also very bad for people with asthma. Wildfire smoke continues to be an issue. I know that the Department of Health is currently updating their guidance around activity and managing um, whether students go to recess and how to respond to wildfire smoke events. Integrated pest management is something that does not get a whole lot of uh, airtime, but is uh, an important component of maintaining a healthy environment. And then the home environment, as Dr. Kish mentioned, and I won't go into that any further. Next slide, please. So one of the things I'm really excited about with these recommendations, uh, not just the school setting recommendations, but the recommendations that apply to other settings. Because one of the things that we really notice in the school setting is the inability or the barriers to communicating and collaborating with the care that's happening in the clinics. Um, and, and whether there's, or even knowing what, who all is involved with a particular child's care. So um, having these recommendations in other settings around coordinating and communicating is really something that I'm excited about. Um, they can call on all of us to communicate and collaborate better. I'm particularly excited about um, asking parents and caregivers to complete a release of information form to allow uh, communication about the asthma plan with the school nurse. We often have things dropped off in the health room and we don't necessarily have access to the parents. So this is really helpful for us if, if the clinic can initiate that side of it so that we can have communication and let the school know when that, when that is in place so that we can more easily call you and, and speak with, uh, with the clinical clinicians. Um, and then aligning uh, educational effort. We are often feeling like we're the only one doing the education piece on uh, inhaler use technique and having some kind of a plan initiated by the clinic side that we can help support and reinforce and we can all be working together on that is really something that um, I'm excited about. And, and I'm very much excited about the idea of of recommending that um, we have a prescription for an inhaler and a spacer to have at school in addition to the one at home at, at the very minimum. Next slide, please. So one of the prompts I was given for this presentation was to imagine what happens if we were able to implement all these recommendations. And, and uh, as I wrote underneath this picture, by the way, this is a stock image. This is not the true Caitlin, who doesn't exist. Um, but really, it, it's just a dream to think about what would happen if all of these children who have out of control asthma have all of the things met and if we are able to collaborate and work together to make sure their needs are met, it's just such an exciting thing to consider. Um, so I envision that Caitlin would have a spacer at school in addition to her inhaler, that we have a release of information so that I can communicate directly with the clinic when I start to see an increase in inhaler use or symptoms, um, that I'm able to find out that there is a community health worker or refer to one and to get some support around addressing mold in the, in the home and making the home environment better. So I envision Caitlin Caitlin thriving and, um, and doing what she is meant to do, which is to learn and reach her potential. So I believe that's my last slide.
and I will turn it back over to Nick. Thank you so much. I hope having trouble unmuting myself, but thank you so much, Annie, and thank you, Doreen. Um, now, I know we're nearing the end of our time, but we do have a brief moment for questions and answers. So I'd like to invite uh, both of you back up to just go over some questions. And again, for those of you in the audience, if you do have any things that you would like to uh, ask, please feel free to put it in the Q&A box. The first relatively brief question that we have from Mary Lou, I believe is directed to Doreen. I think in your uh, presentation, you mentioned October visits for asthma care and control. Uh, and Mary Lou is wondering if it's possible to move those up to June or July to make asthma medication orders for school. It's a good question because uh, in July, August, we're doing all these school forums and kind of getting things ready. Um, I will say that in summer, asthma really comes down. Um, it's not on parents' minds. It's not on kids' minds. A lot of them go off their daily controller because asthma is your healthy season. And then the fall comes and you catch your first cold and now asthma's back on your mind. So um, you can anytime get a refill to get your meds. We're filling out the forms usually without a visit. That's all just sort of being done. But I like the October visit because the most important thing we can do is get you ready for cold and flu when you're paying attention and get your flu shot. And if we see them in June, July, and they're not really worried about their asthma, they're not as engaged and they may not come back for that flu shot. Thank you, Dory. I also see a question from Audrey about what date these recommendations became effective. Um, and I just want to say that uh, we finished our work group meetings in January of 2023 this past year and sent those on to the Fulbright Collaborative and they were approved late January, I believe January 25th. So those recommendations are on our website and I believe that we would be able to provide a link uh, either at the end of this meeting or in follow-up materials if you're interested in finding those. Perfect. Um, again, please feel free to enter questions, but in the meantime, I do have one pre-prepared question that I'd like to ask uh, both Annie and Doreen, and that is, what in your opinion is the most significant barrier to implementing these guidelines and recommendations, and how might we go about addressing those barriers? on the clinic side, um, it takes time, it takes staff, and it's a lot of unpaid work. Um, and it's a huge barrier because it often simply just doesn't get done. Um, clinics are way too busy and never have enough time. And asthma care is all about education. Um, and so repeat visits, convincing a family that there's value to come back and learn about this. Um, if they think their kid is fine, they often don't. I will support what Dr. Kish said. And also I think, you know, it comes back to the funding again. And on the school side, you know, we never have enough school nurses. So when you have a school nurse who has three to five school buildings that they're responsible for, they may be in a school one or two days a week. Um, there's just not enough time to capture all of the students and to pay enough attention to, you know, when you're not there, you don't see the symptoms increasing or you don't see the symptoms occurring. So, you know, it's it's my, my plug in for improved school nurse staffing, which is something I come back to with almost every health condition is is huge. And, um, and, and that increased connection to, um, to the clinic in, you know, having, having the staff be open and able to, um, to connect to in the clinic was is really crucial. Thanks to Annie and Doreen, hearing a lot about staffing issues as well as communication and making sure that we're really hammering those points in to make sure we're all talking together. We have a, another uh, audience question, again from Mary Lou asking, is it normal procedure for the clinic to notify schools about changes in the asthma plan uh, especially after these fall appointments that you're talking about, Doreen? 
Uh, I don't think it's normal procedure at all, um, but we do often when we write an asthma action plan, we ask the family to bring it into the school. Thank you. And maybe that's uh, a way that hopefully our recommendations can have an impact to making sure that communication happens. Uh, one last uh, sort of happy note to, to end the webinar on. My last question is, um, what are you most proud of about these recommendations? Or perhaps what are you most excited about? I, I've directly seen the result of when a community health worker works with a family. I mean, it's just remarkable, the improvements that happen. Um, my clinic is doing a grant from the DOH for two community health workers for other things besides asthma, but to see the state go in this direction, I think is very exciting um, and I think could have a huge impact. To, to chime in, I, I will add one of the things I learned from participating in this work group that I really appreciated hearing was this assumption that we all had that community health workers worked better in person. And one thing that we found out during the pandemic is that telehealth visits actually worked really well for, for this work in terms of having the families be in charge of that visit and move their device around the house to show different parts. Um, that turned out to be really powerful, and that was exciting to me. Thank you so much, Doreen and Annie. I think that's all the time we have today for questions, but I really appreciate both of you participating on our work group conversations throughout last year and for sharing your experience at our webinar today. And then Real quick, before we close today, I just wanna to highlight that the Bree Collaborative has uh, several upcoming webinars, a little bit more specific to our focus on equity. So actually next Thursday, we have a health equity webinar on committing to action, and that will be Thursday, March 9th from noon to 1.30 p.m. And then in April, we have a webinar on climate change that will be held on April 12th, again, from noon to 1.30 p.m. So those registration links are open and Emily has dropped them in the chat, but you can also find them on our website if you are interested. Uh, but again, thank you all for attending today to learn more about our pediatric asthma recommendations. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank you. Thanks, Annie. Thanks, Dory.